My grandma Betty was born in 1925 Sherwood, Oregon. When she was young, she was kicked out of Sunday school because her socks were too short and her ankles were exposed. Left at home every Sunday, she decided to take on the responsibility of cooking dinner for her large family of nine. Later on in her life, cooking became her favorite hobby. She learned how to cook from news article recipes, people, and experimenting in the kitchen. In the 1970s, she began to look for a space to open a restaurant. By the early 1980s, she found a space in Foster City to open her restaurant. Tell my sister, I didn't tell nobody in my family I was buying a restaurant because they would call me stupid. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't do that. You never had that and anything. And I said, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to do it. Oh, I, like it was it was a lot of work. I I um, got there at seven, and I had um, Pinky. My uh, chef, he was there at seven, and Brian was there at seven. So we started breakfast for people, and if people like certain things, I put a lot of effort in making a, a good breakfast. I made a goal to make it good, because I want them to be happy, mm -hmm. and that's what I mean. So I think. The concept of cooking, in my mind, in my life, is to make people happy. And I think that happiness makes people live longer. I think that it does. Now, I'm living to be 89, and my, uh, my family, they all have high blood pressure, and I try not to have salt or sugar or any of that to uh, prevent from having a heart attack. So good health. Good health is your wealth. Sadly, because of the rising popularity of fast food restaurants, my grandma's restaurant only remained open for five years. To this day, my grandma loves when our large family comes together for the holidays and eats food that she once made in her restaurant and ate as a child. My grandma taught my dad, Brian, how to cook many of the recipes that I have for dinner today. I believe that the restaurant business taught my grandma that food is a way to express that you care for someone and always make sure that we know how important it is to nurture your body and soul with good food. My mom and I like cooking Guatemalan food together. Even though she was born in LA, she still enjoys bringing some of her Guatemalan heritage to San Francisco. How she is able to do this is by a recipe book full of traditional Guatemalan recipes that my grandmother had handwritten to pass on our tradition. Mom, what's the significance of the recipe book? Um, I think the significance for me is that Abuelita Sonia, my mom, took the time to write this recipe book and give it to me and pass on our family's history. In it are the recipes that she shared with me when I was growing up, um, so for the different holidays, definitely Christmas Eve, um, Easter, our birthdays, um, different celebrations that we would have, um, anniversaries, um, baptisms, things like that. So mom, what does food mean to our family's culture? To our family, food means unity. It's the bond that keeps us all together. multicultural family with rich culinary traditions. My maternal grandmother, Raya Maurer, comes from Kishinev, Bessarabia. And my paternal grandmother, Soon Kyung Kim, comes from Seoul, Korea. 
While they're still with me, I want to learn as much as I can from them. Borscht is a soup done by Jewish people. And I can tell you the ingredients. It is meat, not fat, but it should be a good bone to it. And all kinds of vegetables that you put in any soup. And this is the ingredients for the borscht. How about beets? I said meats. No, not meat, but beets. Yeah, she, she, she said it, I forgot. Beets, mm -hmm. a lot of beets, because the beets make the borscht red. Ah. And this is this main thing that called borscht. It's red soup. And the more different kind of vegetables you have, the better the borscht. Mm -hmm. And someday, then you'll have the time and you'll have the meat. Mm -hmm. I will start with you from beginning to the end. I learned to cook uh, when I was... Uh, uh, growing up, uh, my mom was uh, cooking and I was looking at it and uh, she, you know, maybe fifth grade, third grade, maybe, yeah. yeah. So little by little I learned from her. From your mom? Yeah, mom. Yeah, my mom was a good cook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What kind yeah. of the Korean oh, the food? Co Korean food, yeah, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, uh, American food I learned when I came here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when did you come to America? Oh, 1963, January. Mm. Yeah, January 19th, I think. And when you came, was it mostly cooking American food, or you still cooked Korean oh, food? Oh, I think mostly uh, Korean food, I mm. guess, yeah. yeah. My husband liked to eat meat, <laughs> so I had to learn and not to cook. <laughs> Before. Do you enjoy cooking, or is it just a chore for you? Uh, half and half. <laughs> But uh, I think enjoy side, yeah, because uh, I've been cooking, you know, all my life, and uh, that's supposed to, you're supposed to do for the, you know, feed the family. So especially women in Asia, mm -hmm. uh, you have to cook. So you have to learn how to cook, and uh, you have to enjoy it too. Yeah. From kimchi to borscht, from Korea to Kishinev, the ingredient they share is love. So this nose, um, I definitely have a love-hate relationship with it. Um, I got it from my dad, and I have two sisters who also have had uh, somewhat similar noses, at least in, in size, and both of, of my sisters chose to get nose jobs. Um, but I wanted to find a way to love what I had instead of trying to change it. And mostly I've done a pretty good job of that. Sometimes I love the fact that I have something that other people don't. Um, but growing up as a teenager with this nose <laughs> was not easy. I had some incredibly mean things said to me as did one of my sisters. Um, but I love the fact that I have something unusual and sometimes something that's seen as beautiful to myself and to others. And 
it came from my dad and his sister has a similar nose and my grandfather had an interesting nose and I assume it went on for generations. So um, it's an Italian amazing nose. I mean, what can I say? I must say I have never liked curly hair because it didn't look smooth, it didn't look uh, um, tameable. It was hard to deal with my hair when it was curly and I didn't know ever how could I get rid of those curls. When I got about 18 years old I heard about straightening hair and that's when I said aha and for the first time I had my hair straightened and I was very happy to have straight hair. It wasn't bulky, it was smooth, and I felt much better about myself. You know, I'm really an old lady now. I'm 90 years old. I actually shouldn't care what sort of hair I have. But I do because having curly hair just uh, is sort of cumbersome and uh, um, just not very pleasant for me, so I keep doing it. Uh, you know, I know a whole bunch of older ladies who go and have permanents, and I think this is so uninteresting, and I never want to look like that. Oh, and then they go have their hair done once a week to have their curl put in and to look as old-fashioned <laughs> as the week before. So you've never been proud of having curly hair at all? Proud of having curly hair? Never. Just never. I was just thrilled when I had straight hair. My father. A man who watches sports. A man who eats meat and potatoes. And a man without hair. <laughs> Dad, take off the wig while we're filming. What wig? Dad. Oh, you mean for real now? Yeah. Thank you. My hair is less now upon my head than it once was, yes? What do they call it? male pattern baldness and uh, for me it wasn't anything dramatically different than a lot of men but as it starts to thin it can start even early signs maybe in your 20s but then in your 30s and it just kind of ramps until you look a whole lot like your mother's father well I never really knew my my granddad on my mom's side, he was an older man for that era. So the only real memory I have of him is through some photos. We did overlap, our lives overlapped for a couple of years, but uh, that was one bald guy. And apparently that's me now. You know, you get a lot of practice getting used to it when it doesn't, doesn't change much. And um, I have to remember to try to keep it cut a lot shorter because it, it gets long and then you look like your math teachers you made fun of in junior high except I've never I've never done the comb over and uh, Mr. Mr. Croc did did the comb over and it was it was just a bad a, a very bad look thank you for not doing that this might happen to you Molly <laughs> My name is Vanessa Gershbein. I'm 18 years old and I'm exploring my family's immigration story. This box is This is the 
passport of my grandfather, who I never met, Benjamin Driftline. It was a passport he had uh, 1921, American Council General for the Journey to the United States. And uh, Benjamin Gersbane. March 21st, 1921. This is his picture. A military man from the Ukrainian Free Army. And this was a time of tremendous confusion and chaos in Russia, especially in the Ukraine. His name was Simon Petlura. He was a highly anti-Semitic gentleman. It's estimated he killed between 30 and 50,000 Jews. My daughter came to our family house uh, one night and uh, told my grandfather that he uh, needed cattle for his army. And he gave the family a uh, specified period of time, two or three days, to um, gather the cattle for uh, his troops so they could uh, eat. Additionally, a pet lord threatened the family with, that he would take the women out and put them in the whorehouses for his troops, and he would burn the house down. My family left that night. Most people come to America to gain more economic or educational opportunities, but my family came to survive. They had to leave to escape the persecution they faced as Jews in Ukraine in the early 20th century. This is Zeta. In the middle, that's him. Your grandpa? No, uh, my, my great grandfather. I have freedoms that are easy to take for granted, but now I know that being an American is a privilege because I don't have to live with the fear of persecution. I know my roots will survive. My family went through the struggle to immigrate to America, and I get to reap the benefits. Here, I'm allowed to be a free, proud, Jewish female. I've had my bat mitzvah. I've celebrated Hanukkah with my family freely. And I embrace my Jewish culture and heritage. When I was four, my mom was accused of murdering my aunt. At first, I didn't know what was going on. It all happened so fast, and no one wanted to tell me anything. I was too little to really understand. I've been thinking a lot about what happened to my family and the reasons we moved from Ecuador to America. I've never gotten a full explanation. I need to know what happened and what brought us here. All I know is that my aunt Yanina's boss killed her. My name is Maria Belen Avellan, and I want my aunt's story to be heard because it's also my story. El presidente de la República cerró los bancos. Entonces, este hombre, como fue sobrino del dueño de un banco, entonces todas las la, los CD que quedaron ahí los empezaron a vender y él los compraba en una cantidad mísera. Entonces Yanina se enteró de toda esta situación y, 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 y como decir hoy día viernes dijo voy a renunciar y él, él eh, voy, le, le dijo al jefe voy a renunciar. Entonces él pensaba que Yanina iba a contar todas estas sinvergüencerías que él había hecho. Entonces se fue, este le, este le dijo que el lunes renunciaba, así que cuando llegó a la oficina le dijo, Yanina, quiero que vengas acá a, a otra parte donde iban, donde eran unas bodegas, quiero que vayas tú a esas bodegas para hacer un balance. Entonces Yanina se, se fue en su carro y de ahí la mandó a perseguir y la cogió y la man, pagó a unos hombres y la, la mató. La venimos 
nosotros acá porque fuimos perseguidos, porque mataron injustamente, entonces él quiso eliminar toda, toda, toda prueba, toda prueba que, se, que sea con, en contra de él, porque él fue el culpable, él mató, la mató a ella. Entonces nosotros en vez de nos convertimos en perseguidos por él. Tanto es así que yo a mí me detuvieron para medrentarme, medrentarnos, no, no seguir acusándolo. The guy who killed my aunt was so powerful that he could just bribe the authorities to look the other way for him to get away with murder. De la noche a la mañana todo todo, todo cambió. Toda nuestra nuestras vidas, nuestra nuestra vida cotidiana ya no era la misma. Al principio estaba como un poco como que quería olvidar y, y, y hacer otras cosas porque para mí el tiempo se detuvo un buen momento. My family still grieves. I see my mom, who hasn't been back to Ecuador in 15 years. I see my grandmothers, who left their way of life behind. Porque yo nunca me imaginé que mi hermana tenía que irse a vivir a otro, otra ciudad, a otro país, sin imaginarme nunca que eso iba a pasar. Al pasar este acontecimiento, esta desgracia, se, se deshizo todo. El cambio fue tremendo. Enseñamos a otra, a otra cultura, a otra clase de vida, como dice mi hermana, la unión familiar. Para nosotros era ir a, la, ir a visitar a una amiga, a la familia, entonces es distinto. En cambio acá ya se va a trabajar mío, mi nuera, las niñas a la escuela. Nosotros pasamos solas, no tenemos amistad. Peor que no, con el idioma no nos podemos comunicar con otras personas. Entonces es tremendo. Que nosotros no estamos tranquilas porque se cometió la injusticia más grande. Nunca nos hicieron justicia. What happened will always affect my family and me. This is part of our identity. This is part of our story. about traveling, traveling from young to old, moving from here to there, that's all traveling. I am traveling through my life. I immigrated in 2006 with my two little kids. I find myself totally lost in the first few years. I was like a little boat in a big ocean. No matter how hard I tried to find my way, I still couldn't move. That's what a cultural barrier feels like, lonely, hopeless, and fearing. San Francisco is a multicultural city. I find out that going back to my heritage would help me to better understand other cultures. I started to practice my traditional way of living rather than the 21st century lifestyle. I slowed myself down and find a greater contentment. Even though I was still alone, I didn't feel lonely anymore. By following the flow of the daily life, I discovered more time, recognizing opportunities, blending with the energies around me to create new things. It all happened during the years of moving. I realized that immigration made me return to my own heritage. Like the yin and the yang, it formed by a circle. I left, I have to return.
My name is Cambria Rose Winchelbaum Warfield. My mom named me after my great grandma Rose Winchelbaum. Grandma's family was from Odessa, Russia, and she was the first one born in the United States. My grandma Winchelbaum had four kids. My dad was the third. But, you know, she just she took care of everybody. Grandma kept Jewish traditions alive in Kansas when no other families in her town were Jewish. Today, my mom teaches my family about those traditions. So that's the first night of Hanukkah, folks. Right next to the Christmas tree. Let's open. <laughs> I hadn't been in the synagogue since I was, you know, seven or eight, so I didn't have any, and I definitely didn't have anything here. But you needed to have something, some place, some extended community to belong to. Because my father is Christian, my family found that community at church. I mean, now we go to the Presbyterian Church. It's more comfortable. There's a lady pastor. It's a small congregation that, you know, takes care of each other, and we know people there, and it's just as comfortable. Even though my family goes to church now, I continue to keep those Jewish traditions alive that my grandma Rose and my mom passed on to me. I don't want to set the world on fire I just want to start a flame in your heart In my heart I have but one desire Come here, my young man. I will tell you my unusual story. You will be impressed. I promise. I was born in Michałowo. I was studying in a local primary school. I remember that like it was yesterday. There were 20 or so in my class. Recall, sorry, my memory is not so well. The time came when I had to grow up and study harder. At the end of the day, I was waiting in a day room for my father, who was returning in the evening from work. I was living so carelessly for a couple of years when I have heard a radio broadcast. They say that soon they will be recruiting every 18-year-old boy into the army to take place in front line. Germany planned to invade Poland. Soon I have enlisted. They have were nine of us in the squad, eight Poles and one Russian guy. He was very mysterious, he wasn't talking much. One day the command gave orders. I wasn't good with the rifle and my athletic skill wasn't also. So I was assigned to scouting. My duty was to patrol the forest near the camp. I thought it was a perfect job. During the patrol suddenly I heard bullets flying by my ear. I would jump into the trenches. When I tried to take a look, I felt terrible pain in my stomach. I was shot. Blood poured up from my wood quickly stained my uniform. I thought it was over. Before I passed out, I saw the Russian guy running my way. I wake up in the hospital, 
I tried to move, but the pain paralyzed my body. I thought my mission was over. Even if I would, I wouldn't be able to save my country. I spent half a year in a hospital. I have decided to start a new life. I have met Anya. I fell in love and first sight. We decided to spend the rest of our life together. We both returned to our home city, Bewistok. We have found a job there and a little house. The building was completely ruined, but it was enough for us. Now I'm here and I am happy.